Uh, leading today's uh, you know, webinar is uh, Maciej Walkowiak. Uh, he joins us from Berlin, Germany. Uh, a quick introduction about Maciej. Uh, Maciej is an independent uh, uh, software consultant with over 14 years of experience uh, in helping companies make the right architectural decisions and build software that's easy to evolve and maintain. Uh, he's currently working with Sentry on building the Sentry Java SDK and also the Spring Boot integrations. Uh, his primary focus is designing and developing applications based on the Spring stack and AWS. Uh, Maciej is an open source uh, you know, enthusiast and uh, you know, he, he leads the Spring Cloud AWS project. Uh, and he's a widely respected contributor to several Spring projects. Uh, he runs the Spring Academy uh, YouTube channel, a uh, very popular channel, I should say, uh, uh, which has uh, you know, very interesting video tutorials uh, uh, and, and, and you know, latest developments uh, from the Java and Spring ecosystem. Uh, Maciej, you know, thanks uh, for taking the time uh, to uh, take the time out to connect with us. Uh, we're so privileged to have you join this webinar. Oh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for a great introduction. It's like the definitely better introduction that I would do to myself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, and then one quick introduction to the session and then I would hand it over to you. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the session is going to focus uh, on Sentry uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, we think it's really valuable because uh, production applications these days are expected to be bug free and, and, and they're expected to run smoothly 24 seven. Uh, you know, programmers uh, can no longer rely on, uh, you know, testing or, or you know, uh, feedback from users to ensure that their applications are reliable. You know, that process is very slow. Uh, you know, they should uh, really be using automated tools that can alert them on issues and applications in real time. Uh, so sometimes, you know, the issue could be like a crash Sometimes it could be, uh, you know, an expensive query eating away at the performance. Uh, so, uh, you know, anybody who's like building and maintaining applications should actually uh, be alerted in real time if there's, if there's either issue, you know, you know, either a performance issue or an actual application crash. Uh, you know, with, with Sentry, you know, uh, the whole process becomes uh, very easy. Uh, you know, uh, either it's a, it's a performance issue or a poor performing API call or a very, very slow database query, you, know, you could actually monitor that in real time and, and take uh, you know, proactive action to ensure that you know, more users don't face the same problem. Uh, Sentry also helps you, uh, you know, fix crashes in real time. And uh, you know, the backend for Sentry is built on Python, but it contains a full API for sending events from any language and many applications. So that's what makes it kind of very, very popular. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, we think, you know, a session on Sentry will really, really help, uh, you know, programmers understand the importance of building, uh, you know, uh, uh, observant and, you know, highly performant applications uh, that work smoothly for clients and users. Uh, so this, the, the structure of the session is pretty simple. Uh, so in keeping with the you know, general structure we have, you know, we have 50 minutes to 55 minutes where uh, Maciej would uh, take us through uh, Sentry um, and, and, you know, uh, there will be, uh, you know, some slides, but a lot of, uh, you know, code alongs and code walkthroughs and actually getting to see how Sentry works in, in real life. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have, you know, for, for any questions that you have, you know, we have like 10 minutes set aside at the end for Q&A. But I was just talking to, you know, Maciej backstage, the virtual backstage, so to speak. And then he said, if you have a question while he's talking, he's, he's welcome to uh, answer them too. So so to keep your questions coming, you know, we'll compile them and ask uh, uh, and then pass them over to Maciej. For him to answer. So with that, you know, I, I request uh, you know Maciej to begin the webinar. Maciej, over to you. Thanks a lot. Let me let me share my screen. Uh, there will be a couple of slides, as Sashi uh, explained, uh, and I kind of have a feeling slowly that uh, Sashi gave such a good introduction to Sentry that I'm not sure how much my slides are really needed, but I will do it. I will do it anyway. Thank you for coming. We are going to talk about troubleshooting Spring Boot applications with Sentry. So I'm very happy that you want to learn how to fix your production issues better, faster, and with less friction. Before we get into Sentry, I would like to uh, say like what, how, how does the, you know, making software looks like nowadays? Like hopefully, uh, hopefully you are following some agile processes. Uh, you have a lot of units and integration tests, so your code is um, covered with tests, and the chances that something sneaks into production is actually low. 
And of course, you release very frequently, ideally a few times a day or maybe once a day or at least a few times a week. Uh, very likely you are deploying to some cloud and you don't deploy it manually, but you rather have it automated. So whenever you push to a Git repository, then the deployment just fires off. And this was very, this is very different from how the software development looked like in 2007. 2007 is the time when I started working uh, professionally as a Java developer in, a, in a actually, like on actually real serious projects in telecom industry. Um, and back then we had no, like no understanding of agile at all. Like we were not really even interested. We would just followed like a very traditional waterfall uh, processes where you know we get some requirements from the from the customer then the customer like the, our business analyst spent time with customers to produce uh, the requirements documents and it were like very well described documents several pages with the whole use cases described with uml diagrams with all the you know validation rules business rules like re really professional ones so then we spent a couple of uh, weeks, like in some cases, these were months. In my cases, these were usually weeks on the development. Uh, and the truth is that we didn't really write much unit tests, not mentioning really integration tests, because we had a QA team and the QA team was responsible for testing, not us developers, of course. And that QA did the manual testing. So they were also, they had like a test scenarios written down. They were going through these test scenarios. And of course, they always found something. So then the, so then the, you know, they were reporting bugs. Then we took it again to fix them a couple of days, maybe weeks in case we screw something really badly. And then, the, and then we sent it back to QA and we did like a couple of cycles like this. And then finally, the application was ready to be shipped. So the next step was to actually send the zip with the, all, the, all the files that were needed for the release. So this was usually like a war or ER file plus the, you know, all the SQL scripts or the XML files that were needed to change, to be changed in the application server. And then the release manager was releasing to to servers that were not in the cloud, but they were rather in the server room. Often the server room was actually in the same building, just you know, behind the wall or at the customer or at the customer location. So we had like a lot of a lot of steps, and each step in each in each step, there were involved a lot of people to make sure that nothing is really uh, wrong, that we are shipping a bug-free software and the release goes smoothly. But of course. It, like, sometimes it did, but often it didn't. Like it happened still that we shipped something to production and we still had issues. So this is where I learned that when something can go wrong, it will definitely will go wrong. Um, so once we had this package deployed to production, we either got a call from the customer saying that, you know, something is not working well. And this was a, really bad case. That's something that we prefer really to avoid. The better case was that we discovered this error by ourselves. So there was a, like we found out that there was an exception logged somewhere on one of the servers. Um, and often these exceptions didn't really tell us much. Like you can see the one on the screen, you can see that there is a null pointer exception, but why did it happen? When did it happen? For whom did it happen? Like we were totally lacking context. And of course, this exception was also not really handled. So for example, this could happen in the piece of code like this. So our approach was to wrap it in the try catch, add some logging statements so that we you know, at least get some more information about it so that we know, okay, so for which user this exception had happened. But then we realized that even though that, we, that it happened for this user, we were also lacking some context. Okay, but what, what actually happened before? So we did like another extra logs to get some you know, info like, okay, so we were doing this before to get a little bit more of the story. And this was okay. Uh, like this was doable. Maybe this wasn't like the perfect option, but at least this gave us enough, enough information to, to solve the problem. But then 
like things have changed, the world has changed, and especially the cloud introduced uh, uh, like the, the most significant change. So we now have cloud and often microservices. So it means that we, not, we don't deploy to just one server or two servers, but rather we deploy many applications to many servers. We don't even, you know, these servers are just spin up out of scale or they are scheduled by uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and also we have a proper security. So we should not, we don't, or at least we shouldn't SSH to production server to check what's inside the logs. So the solution uh, that came up like together with the cloud and to, 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 uh, to address this issue that we have so many servers, so many applications was to like, instead of logging this, all of these uh, errors or, or in general logs to files, uh, instead we log to some log aggregators. So then all of, the, all of the applications log something and these logs are sent to the log aggregation service. And this log aggregation service has a, UI where you can browse it, you can filter it, and so on. And this is, of course, the approach that, that uh, I've used in one of the projects that I had. We had a microservices architecture with around like 20, maybe to 25 services. And it was like huge load, a lot of traffic, mobile traffic, especially with millions of users. And, and things were happening in production all the time. So my approach was that I, in the morning, I went to one of the log aggregators and, uh, and browse all the exceptions that were logged during the past 24 hours. And I was, had to like check if this is important, how often does it happen, uh, which service, which environment. And you can imagine that doing this every day in the morning was not really the, the the way I would like to spend time. And it's also, I believe, not the time uh, I believe should be spent because I just, you know, was like doing a machine work, going through the logs, checking what's important, what's not important, trying to get as much context as I have, and then reporting it into Jira so that uh, me or, or other developers can address it or the PO can, can prioritize it. So then I had this idea that, you know, it would be nice if this, you know, this error log actually could be reported to Jira automatically uh, so that I don't have to do it by myself. But I did not come up with an idea how this could be done. Uh, I just had an idea that it would be nice like that it is done. But fortunately, some other people did. And this is how they created Sentry because Sentry, this is exactly what it is. Like it's a tool where you can just send error logs and they are turned into issues. And also they, it has like a lot of integration. So this thing of creating Jira tickets or notifying on Slack or notifying on some alerting service and so on, this is all done automatically. Quick intro about me. I'm, I'm an independent consultant and I work since almost the beginning with, uh, with Spring Framework and Spring Ecosystem in general. Uh, since over a year, I lead efforts on Spring Cloud AWS project, which is uh, as a community project to integrate Spring with, AW, with proprietary AWS services. And I've been also working with Sentry, helping them to build integrations with Spring and other backend technologies. I also run the Spring Academy YouTube channel that is not maybe very active recently. Uh, but I encourage you to go there and, and check it out. Maybe you will find something that is useful. And without more, you know, talking to slides, I would like to show you how the Sentry actually work and how can you use it. So now I will stop sharing my screen if I find my cursor. So, so Sentry is a Sentry has a UI, like a, it's a web application where you can just go to, you can, you go to sentry.io where you have to create an account um, and you get access to a view more or less like this. I have already here one project. So if you just sign up with an, without, you know, any, with a 
clear account, this will be this will look slightly different. But you can think about like every application is a separate project. So whenever you want to create an application that should report to Sentry, you create a project with Sentry. So that's what we will do. Um, I'm creating a new project, and then I can choose to what language or framework I am going to use. And you can see here that the choice is quite wide. So you can choose from mobile uh, frameworks to front-end frameworks through back-end frameworks and pretty much any language. So these were just the most popular ones, but if you, you can see here that we support pretty much anything that is currently popular, including serverless uh, solutions. So in my case, I'm going to, to server and I'm going to choose just plain Java. And I hit create project. And then I will see a wizard, like how to integrate this sentry with my code. And the idea is that uh, we don't want to, it to become a hassle. Like the Sentry should be as easy to integrate with whatever you are working on as possible. So in my case, I'm, I'm, I have a, like a sample Java project for now, we will just start with a pretty much like a hello world application. So, and it uses uh, Maven as a build tool. So I'm going just to copy this dependency, add it to my pom.xml. Now I need to refresh. IntelliJ. And then the next step is that Sentry SDK has to be initialized. And it's again, like we can just take this snippet and copy it to, to our code. This has to run as soon as possible after your application starts. Because like before, like if something happens before, like if an error is logged before, then it means that you will not get this error reported right has first has to the init has to happen then uh, then we will start reporting to sentry okay so i will just paste this snippet over here and like the one thing you can see is that the the dsn so dsn is like a like an api key this should not leak anywhere because if anyone has this key then it means that they will be able to report issues into your sentry which is obviously not something that you probably not, not something that you really want. Uh, but for now, we just keep it here. Uh, then there is a tra trace sample rate that we will not talk about yet, but we will talk about it later. And then there is a debug flag that I believe it's worth keeping. So with a debug flag, you will get also a debug information from Sentry SDK. And especially at the beginning, it's worth to keep it set to true so that you know that you're, you, you integrated it properly because it may happen that you think that you integrated it properly, but then you don't see exceptions in, in Sentry. Uh, but of course you should not push it to production like this. So, okay, so once Sentry is initialized, we can start using it. And this piece of code over here has a one problem. Like it's a, it's a, it's a trivial, simple piece of code. Uh, so I'm creating an instance of a conference object and then I'm trying to print a name to lowercase. And since the name is null, if I run it, of course this will lock, uh, This will lock an error and it will lock an error with logback. So that's another dependency that I have configured in this project. So right now, nothing happens because like I initialize Sentry, but you know, it's, there is no magic here. Like it doesn't really uh, send, this, send this exception really magically uh, to Sentry, but that's what, we, that's what we want, right? So we don't want this to be just locked, but we also want to send it to Sentry. So Sentry has a static as the static API. Every you can call Sentry dot, and all the all the things that you can do with Sentry are pretty much available here. And there is a very convenient method just to capture exception. So now, if I would run it again, this would be sent to uh, this would be sent to Sentry. So let me try. I will run it. Okay, and now in the logs, we will find some extra information. So this is coming from the Sentry SDK. It shows that it's initializing the SDK. And then uh, you will see that 
serializing objects. So this is exactly the JSON that is sent to Sentry. And now if I go to uh, Sentry.io, go to projects and hit Java, and then I hit issues. Maybe that's a better place. So this is where you will see um, all the error events that have been reported to Sentry. And you can see already that this is very different from a regular log ag aggregators because it doesn't seem like you are browsing a text file with just with a logs. So every log is added here and, uh, and it looks more like a, like an issue with like a Jira issue than, than actually like a, like a log statement. So if this exception would happen more than once, you will see, you will find here that this is not just one event, but basically more events. And this is how many users are affected. But since Sentry SDK currently is not really aware of users and also our application does not have a notion of users, then it just says that it's zero. So if I go into details, um, you will see already some extra information about the error. So first thing is, of course, the exception and the message. This is what is what is crucial. But you will also find like what is the JVM runtime, what is the JVM name, and with which SDK version this has been uh, reported, which is uh, probably nice. But of course, it's also not enough. So the strong point of Sentry is that we can add this contextual information. So we want to know more about in what conditions has this error happened. And the one way to do it is to configure, uh, uh, configure Sentry options. So on Sentry options, we can set some properties that will be attached to every error reported to Sentry. And one of this is, for example, setting the environment. So if we set this environment, let's say in this case to local, all of these errors will be reported with the environment local. So that's, it's very easy to distinguish in which, um, yeah, if it is the error happened in staging, production, or whatever types of environments uh, you use. And we can also set the release version. So what is the version of our application? It's not the, not the version of Sentry SDK, but rather the version of, um, of our application. So every time we release, if we use a versioning like this, we should probably bump this release to another version. Also, not every property should be applied to every error. Like you can think about, uh, uh, let's say when you have HTTP requests, every request creates some sort of different scope. Like if the error happens in the scope of the HTTP request, you would like to have the contextual information about the HTTP request. So Sentry has a, an API to configure a scope. So that's exactly what it is. So we have a scope and then everything that will be set on the scope will be also attached to events that happen on this scope. And in such a way, we can, for example, set the user. So which user was affected by this, uh, by this error? Okay, so now if we run this again, all of the information that we added here should be available also in the new event that was uh, that was reported. And it can take a few seconds. Not more. Okay, now we can see that this was a this was reported like 17 seconds ago. So now we can see that the environment for this is set to local, and this happened for this user. We also get the server name by default, so we get it from from the from the from where from host name cache, like the Java networking thing. Um, okay, and also this information is added here on the side when you find tags. So 
in the tags, we will find that 50% of errors of this type happened in production because production is the default environment and 50% happened in the production that is set to local. And now if I click on it, I can also just browse through all the events that happened uh, that, that match basically this query. So I can search like, okay, give me all the events that happened for the, in the environment local. So it's not only about getting the details when you go to the details of the issue, but also the ability to search through them. Okay. So now if we, if we fix this bug and change the name to what would be, this would be star of Java. Now this line will not cause an error, but then the method party uh, will just throw another exception. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, 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 I was also, the intention was also to bump the release version over here. So I'm not sure if this is now, if my concept will now work. Okay. Uh, yeah, so every new issue will have this uh, label that it's a new issue. So also in the UI, you can quickly see what issues have been like reported before or on what issues are the new issues. So now if we go, let's say to this old one, we can, we, we have now fixed it. So we can mark this issue as, uh, res uh, as resolve, right? So we just check the checkbox, click resolve, and then the issue is gone. Like if I refresh this page, it should not reappear really here anymore. But the issue can also come back. So let me bump now the release version and then um, make this issue appear again. And then hopefully when this issue appears here again, we will see a red label that it's a regression. So this is something that we should definitely look at because this is something that we considered to be already fixed. Okay, so now we can see that this issue is a regression and this one is a new issue. So now I think you have a, you have a good feeling of how to use the Sentry SDK, like static SDK, like the, if you like calling the Sentry static SDK APIs. Um, but that's not really something that we want you to do too often, right? Because I, I said at the beginning that the, the point is to, to be as frictionless as possible. So you just do as little steps as needed to actually get the SDK and all the integrations working. Like I can imagine that in your code, there would be many places with this try catch exception and you don't want to go everywhere now and put the sentry capture exception uh, because this will be another, another very boring task. But uh, sentry comes also with integration with logback, um, meaning that whenever you use logback and actually also other logging frameworks like log4j2 or Joule, so that whenever you log uh, an error, we will automatically convert it to, to sentry error. So first we need to add the sentry logback dependency, and then we need to go to logback.xml and configure a new appender. So then the, the last thing we want to do is do appender ref and then sentry. So now we will not need any more the sentry capture exception over here, but it will be just enough to, to log an error and this error will be automatically, um, automatically converted into the issue. But probably you remember that uh, I also talked the way we approached the errors before was just to add some info uh, logs so that we get some story about what happened before in the application. Um, so that's what this, uh, so Sentry can also, Sentry, Sentry can also utilize that. So now if I look again into what was reported through a log back, and I go into the details, you will see some extra fields over here. So there is a breadcrumbs section. And breadcrumbs are like, you know, the 
crumbs of bread. So like the little small things that happened before that led into this exception. And by default, we convert every logger info or warning into a breadcrumb, into a breadcrumb. So whatever you would have here, this is added as a breadcrumb to the error. But the benefit over like a regular logging is that these logger infos are not reported into Sentry unless the exception happened. So the Sentry doesn't get cluttered with, um, with unnecessary information if everything is working fine as expected. I can see that there is a message in the chat. Do we have any recording which can we find later? As far as I know, this is going to be recorded and uploaded to YouTube in start of YouTube channel. Okay. Good. So this is this is using the Sentry SDK and the logback integration. Um, if you are using Spring, luckily you don't have to go that low level. So with Spring, we have some special special stuff. Uh, again, following this idea that we don't want you to, to do too much to get as much as you can from Sentry. Um, I have prepared here to uh, like a one application that we can call it microservices. This doesn't have much to do with microservices, but there is a, there is a React frontend that calls over HTTP one service, this service takes some stuff from the database and then also calls another service. So we have this cascade of free requests. So there's a React frontend, then there is a movie service uh, and the movie service is made in a way that it will fail 33% of times. Um, and then it calls the movie rating service that is also meant to fail 33% of times. So let me check if we are lucky or not. Like if we go here, there is a chance that if I click load movies, it will fail or maybe it will not fail. It didn't, so it's cool. Um, so this just loads information about movies from the movie service and then movie service goes to rating service to get the rating. If it fails to get the rating, then we don't see the number of stars, but we see this guy with, you know, what can I do? Um, and we want this, these two applications to integrate with Sentry uh, without doing much work. Okay, so let me go now again, back to Sentry.io and then create a new project. Now we don't choose, we are not choosing Java, but we have a dedicated wizard for Spring Boot. So I will name this project name Movies Service. And then the wizard will be also slightly different. So I take this dependency and it's a dependency, not just to IO Sentry.Sentry, but rather Sentry Spring Boot Starter. So we go to Spring Movie Service, uh, pom.xml. Oh, is the standalone version? Let's uh, let's talk about it uh, at the end, right? I have a little bit like a small slide about it. So I'm adding this dependency to Sentry Spring Boot Starter, and I also will add a dependency to Sentry Logback. So now let me refresh it, and I go back to the to the wizard. And it shows me now to configure Sentry just using the regular Spring Boot uh, way of configuring stuff. So uh, through the environment that is like by default defined in the in the application dot properties. Um, okay. So we keep it over here. So since it is in application.properties, it can be also injected through any other way using Spring Boot environment. So as I said, like this actually should not be really here, right? This line should not exist and the Sentry DSN should be set through the environment variable or something else, but just it shouldn't be in the source code. Like you can think about it like any other secret. 
Um, but for now, we keep it here. Yeah, so then it also says about sentry logback. Uh, that's, that's fine. So now we have this project configured. And we also want to do the same for the Spring rating service. So again, we go here, we create a new project that will be Spring Boot. Rating, rating service. Uh, copy the starter and actually I can copy it from here. Oh, there was a the, there was a new version released. I think no, it says that it's five for all. It's weird. It sounds it looks like a bug in IntelliJ because it tells me to upgrade five for free to five for all. Okay, so now I go to the rating service, and then I configure this over here. Um. That's good. And I would also like to get the information about the user that was affected by the by this bug. But this you can imagine is not, um, it is a sensitive information, right? Because then it means that we are sending the user information like a potential username or the email address to Sentry. Um, so that's not something necessarily we want to do. So this is an opt-in function. You have to be really um, convinced and you have to do it explicitly that you do want to send, a it's called default PII, so the personal identifiable information. And in this case, like if you are using Spring Security and this is what we are using over here, basic of hard coded so it will be attached to to the to the errors all right so once once we have this configured let me now i have these applications running in the background but let me now um oh, sorry let me now restart them and in the meantime i can see the chat and the Q&A. Uh, cool. OK. OK, so now when these applications are both up, and I hit the load movies again. Oh, OK, so now there is this 30% this, this happened that uh, um, that it means that the, the first service actually failed. So now if I go to project dashboard and I go to issues, uh, there is a great chance that we will, find, uh, we will find something. I just need to change the project. So I go to movie service and I'm looking for the, for the errors that happen in the movie service. So we see that this is a new issue. It wasn't handled. And I go into the details and I, then I get quite a lot of interesting information. Right, so okay, I have this environment set to production because I did not change it manually. By default, it is set to production, but if I would like to change it, I just do it over here with a traditional way of configuring Spring. Um, I have also information that this happens to a username Mache, and I also get the IP address, but since I'm hitting this from the local host, you get the IP address. It's not necessarily maybe very useful. And it also gets some information about the browser. So I did it from Chrome and it happened on Mac OS. Uh, you can see the whole stack trace over here. Like by default, we filter out all the unnecessary information. So we just keep the, the stuff from your package and we detect this package automatically. So you also don't need to configure it, but if you want to see the whole stack trace, you can also see it here. And if you just need to copy paste it, you know, somewhere, then uh, you can see the, the raw version of it. You will see the breadcrumb. So what happened before it, the error happened. So you will see that, okay, this happened for the get request to movies. Then there was a log statement to log movies. And then you will see like all the information about the HTTP request. So all the headers that were sent, and you can even take this as a curl and you can have a, you can have a, like you have a copy pasteable uh, command to, 
to pretty much replicate this issue, which I think is like super, super nice, super handy. Um, also note that even though we did not configure logback except adding this dependency, we already have these uh, breadcrumbs added, added here. Because this is this is this is working in a way that we detect that okay you're using Spring Boot and you have a logback so we have a logback specific auto configuration that just adds Sentry Appender um, yeah just just out of the box this is something that you can of course um, disable and now we have a question does it bring any extra overload to the application in terms of keeping sending exceptions to Sentry? a tiny little bit. So you can think about it in a way, every time you add something to your application that does anything, it adds some overhead. But uh, in case of Sentry, it adds very little because we don't send these events on the thread, on the, like, on the executing threads, but we rather capture the exception, and then we have a separate thread pool that sends these exceptions to Sentry. So users are completely not affected. Of course, it does a little bit on the server. So it, you know, it does I/O because it sends events to Sentry. It does you know it consumes a little bit of CPU cycles, but you can be totally sure that it's nothing in comparison to what your application does normally. So no no risks about slowing down your application because of that. Okay, so this is this is capturing errors, and this is from this is something that same Sentry is is really famous uh, from. Uh, but also, um, since a couple of years, I don't know exactly how long in general, but I know that it's been like a year for Java. We also have a support for measuring performance because you can imagine. Having the having the let's say exception free application does not necessarily mean that the application has no issues. One thing is that it's uh, that it's working without bugs. Another thing is that it's working let's say fast enough. And especially nowadays when people are not very patient, and you know, especially when you are on your mobile, and waiting one hundred milliseconds more becomes actually a problem then measuring performance has become something that is not a nice to have, but rather a necessity when you're building a web applications. So we automatically also trace, uh, they capture the performance of the application. And that's this one property that I didn't want to explain at the beginning. Uh, trans traces sample rate, this means what percentage of traces we want to capture into Sentry? And by default, it's 100%. So it's a, from zero to one. So this means that now if I go to performance, I should see something here. And for some reason, I'm not. Did I invoke it again? Oh, no, I didn't because it failed. OK, so let me. Oh, this 30% of times happens way too often. OK, so now I managed to load it. So hopefully, um, so hopefully now if I go here, uh, we can see that there was an exception. We don't, we don't have debug set to true, which would be kind of nice now at this moment when I'm not sure why this is not happening. So let me go back to movie service. Okay, good. Okay, so it was just, you know, we didn't have any transactions, so nothing was reported. So now if I go to performance tab, I will see all the transactions that uh, happen in my application. And by the transaction, transaction is uh, just like a concept, like a top level thing that has to be measured. So for HTTP requests, this will be like, uh, we name them by HTTP method, and then what's the URL? So in, in this case, it's get movies. And 
oh, these actually these transactions were reported before they were just not displayed because it always takes like for exceptions, it takes like maybe 15 seconds to display them in Sentry. I think for transactions, especially at the beginning, it's a little bit longer. So now here we have like all the all the all the transactions, all the instances of this transaction that happened. We can sort them by recent, or you can you know we can like sort them to like to see the what was the what was the slowest transaction. So let's go to what we will see here that there was one that is one twenty four. Okay, let's let's say let's go to this one. Oh, so this one is maybe not the best example because it, it failed immediately. But here we can see that this, that this transaction took 257 milliseconds and it actually failed over here. We can also see that there, uh, the breadcrumbs similar to exceptions. So we can see what happened before in the application and the, like all the contextual information that you could also see in the exceptions. But if the exception happened within this transaction, uh, these transactions are connected with sentry errors. So now if I click here, it will take me to the error report. And similar, you can go from the error report into the, into the transaction. If you scroll down to the trace details and click on view summary for this transaction. Uh, but that's not exactly what I wanted to show because like having just this 200 milliseconds for a transaction is also not really telling you more like a uh, transaction as I usually composed of something that we call spans, but I just need to find one that did not fail immediately. So if I take the, the most recent one, and I think this will be it. Okay. So now this, this was the transaction that actually managed to load all these movies, right? So we went to uh, the database, fetched the movies, then we went to the rating service to fetch the, to fetch the ratings. So we can see here that, okay, this whole transaction took one second, but this is composed from um, multiple spans. Um, so there was a, we can see that there was a call to, uh, to another service and this HTTP client comes from the fact that we automatically instrument, that we automatically instrument REST templates. We have also instrumentation for pain and other stuff. Uh, and then this actually happened on another server. So now we can see also a little bit more breakdowns, uh, breadcrumbs. Um, okay. And this is a part of a, this transaction. Now we see only what happened in the movie service, but we can see that this is a part of the bigger trace. So here, uh, we should actually see even also that it comes from the from the React application. But anyway, out of the box, we get this uh, transaction for the for the incoming HTTP request and also outgoing HTTP requests uh, that are executed using the REST template. But I mean, this is nice, but also not often not enough. So if you would like to measure time that it takes to execute a certain method. Uh, you can annotate a class or a method with at sentry span. And this means that execution of every public method in this class will result in creating a sentry span. So we will get a sentry span from this um, movies method on the controller. And we can also do the same with, let's say, annotating a, a method in the movie service, sentry span. So in this case, only this one method in the service would create a span. Another thing that is really, really nice to have, and that's a recent addition to Sentry, is to trace the database queries, because that's often where the time is actually spent. Like, especially when you have an application that just talks to the database and then, you know, saves it, converts it, does some business logic and returns to the user. Uh, then tracing the database, it's, it's, a, it's a must, because this is where the time is spent and this is how you can detect uh, slow queries. So we have a, another module that is called Sentry JDBC. And under the hood, we use something that is called P6 Spy. So that's the, that's the library for for like logging. Like I think the, 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 the simplest usage is just to log 
exactly the uh, SQL queries that go to the database and also output how much time it took to, to execute them. But we don't want this in the logs, but we rather want it to be reported as a span into Sentry. So we have our custom integration, Sentry dash JDBC. And the configuration for this is also relatively simple. When we have a, uh, when we have a JDBC URL, we need to prefix it with P6 spy. So without this, this would be like a default URL for H2. We need to prefix it with P6 spy, and we also have to change the driver class name. This is not really how to configure Sentry or anything like this. This is the these are the steps to configure P6 spy in Spring Boot application. And no matter if you use Sentry or not, if you want to have this information about slow queries, this is a pretty good way to do it. Just without Sentry, you get it in the logs. Okay, so now let me now restart this movie service. So we will see again how, how does the transaction look like. Mm, so there's a question. Is it possible to grab reports from Spring Actuator metrics also into Sentry? And the answer is no because this is a slightly different, different thing. Like uh, metrics are not the same as tracing. So metrics just give you a number for something. You have like a metric key and a metric number, and that's not something that is supported in Sentry. In Sentry, we rather support the whole transaction and breaking it down into smaller pieces so that you can see what took time, but not to display some arbitrary metrics like you can do with some other monitoring solutions. I hope it answers. If not, feel free to, to ask the question again. Okay, so now let me, let me try to call it again. So I hope this will not fail like immediately. Okay, so now it, it worked. If I go again to, to traces, this will hopefully show me the most recent one. It's not yet here. So we will probably have to wait maybe a few seconds. And this new transaction that comes in should be broken down much better into, into spans. It just always takes a little bit more of time, which is not a problem when you actually use Sentry, but it is definitely a problem when I'm showing it to anyone because it creates this awkward moment of silence. Okay, so now we can see that there was a transaction reported at 1.23 UTC time. And now we can see the separate spans for these methods that we annotated with at sentry spans. We also see a database query over here. We like it was super fast because it uses in-memory database. But now I think you get a like a pretty, pretty good um, overview of what actually is taking time in your request. So it's not a black box anymore, but it's rather something that you can really analyze and address. Okay, and the stuff that I shown from the performance, they work with Spring MVC. And of course, it's not always the case uh, that uh, you are using Spring MVC. Like another very often use case that happens very often is that you use messaging. So for example, you retrieve a message from Kafka or you retrieve a message from RabbitMQ or any other messaging solution. And we do not provide at least for now, integrations with such services. Uh, but we, we, we provide an option to make it easy for you to integrate it with, with anything. I mean, this option, of course, comes with some pros and cons, but, uh, uh, but it's, it's, I think it's a quite nice addition. So this is a, this is a component that listens for RabbitMQ messages. And then when it, when it return, receives a message, then it updates the score. So, 
so let's go here. I will put a sentry, sentry span over here so that we get some details. And now any method that I want to turn into transaction that is not happening in the scope of the Spring MVC request, I can annotate with at sentry transaction where I name the transaction, let's say score update. Uh, so there is a, there are two names. The one is the name and another is a value. So the value could like the, the sorry, the op will be, what op stands for operation. So it will be, let's say AMQP. So the protocol that is used to send rabbit messages. So now, okay, let me restart it. It shouldn't take too long. And then I go to my rabbit MQ management console to choose to score updates. And let me send this message with a hope that this is already up. Okay, message published. We can see that it was published. And so now in the second, there should be a new type of transaction here. So there should be not, sorry, let me go back to now to, to a different service. So before we just had this get rating, but now we should also have a new transaction which will be named score updates. Okay, so now we have a new question, how it works for SQS, SNS, et cetera, we shall be able to measure performance. So you can use this approach pretty much like you can annotate with at sentry transaction and if you find that this at sentry transaction does not fill your needs then uh, it's not a, let's say a big issue it just means that you have to put a little bit more effort so uh, in this let's go to this example now where we had the static api we have also sentry start transaction so now this is how you can do it manually. You have transaction and then you can start child and this will be a child span. So when you have a child span, you can go to another and start child and so on. So you could write your own wrapper around, let's say any messaging library. I mean, the, the one that you are interested in particular, uh, or you could just does, add this to your production code. It only depends how much effort you wanna put. I hope it answers. Now let's go back here, refresh the page. We should get a transaction. Yeah, so we have the score update. So it's a new transaction. We have one event. Uh, with, with a span that we defined over here. So with this, you can turn pretty much anything into transaction. Uh, just one note, this works for, let's say, servlet stack. So the blocking APIs, this is not going to work yet for Webflux or Project Reactor. Uh, so we have a new question in Spring Boot also using transaction because I'm using SQL at the C here also too. This is totally different transaction. This has nothing to do with the transactions you know from the, from the relational databases. It's just the names are the same, but... Uh, Oh, we have so many questions now. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so there is no conflict and no, uh, like it's a totally two, two different concept. Trans Sentry transaction, SQL transaction. Nothing to, nothing to be confused about. Hope it answers. If not, let me know. Okay, okay, cool. So now we have, uh, we can also start Sentry transaction in AOP. Like around annotation, I will start and end transaction. Exactly, exactly. And what's maybe a little bit funny this is pretty much how the at sentry transaction works so we have this sentry transaction advice so that's the part of the um, of the sdk code base uh, which is an advice that basically checks like okay there is an annotation on the method so we pretty much start the transaction with you know with 
some little hints. But if you will find that you want to do something similar, definitely going to our source code to see something that you can maybe copy and modify a little bit is the way to go, I would say. Uh, and then there is a last question. Does it mean that we cannot use Sentry for Webflux at all at this moment? And the answer is a little bit fuzzy. So you cannot use monitoring. So the mon monitoring does not work at the moment at all. We have experimental support for uh, error reporting with Webflux. But this experimental su support ended up being a little bit buggy. So we have a, right now we have a bug reported uh, for that. And we have a pull request that fixes this bug. We are just considering if the fix is the if the, is the right way to go or not. And this comes with the fact that these reactive APIs work very different from, from the traditional blocking APIs. And uh, our SDK uh, is built around this calling static methods on Sentry class or logging with, uh, with logback that takes also something from the thread local context. And this too does not really don't really work well. Like the the reactive and statics and thread locals don't really match very well. So there are just some ways how this can be work around, but none of these ways is actually good. So you can like choose the lesser evil, and then that's what we are doing right now. Okay. All right. So I think uh, that's all the questions we have. What do we have? Like another. Okay, so uh, one one question that was sent to me, uh, uh, Mache, is uh, uh, around licensing. Uh, uh, is there, you know, like 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 we have in the case of Swagger, is there a community edition that one could install locally? Yes, definitely yes. Like if you if you give me like five more more minutes, then I will go for the second part of slides that I have. If that's fine. Oh, so that's absolutely okay. Yeah. So we we have like another ten minutes, and we can close after that. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, I will. I will definitely make it. And uh, and I thought about your question, so I predicted that someone may ask it. Uh, yeah. So, so we should be good. I just don't yeah. see my slides. Well, I don't see my slides. Okay, so here. Okay, so so we have more integrations that I uh, that I've shown. Uh, and I don't know why I can't get rid of this over here um, so mainly it's around spring mvc we have this retrieving user information from spring security we also uh, instrument rest template web client we have this automatic logback configuration and this declarative stuff with sentry span and sentry trans like transactional what you have seen uh, we also support from very recently uh, this is JDBC and GraphQL Java, which I find super cool because now with GraphQL uh, Java, uh, GraphQL Java is like on the lower level, but on the top of it, you have Spring GraphQL and you have also Netflix DGS. So when, if you are using either of this with Spring MVC under the hood, you have automatically you know, support for Sentry. We have also OpenFane, Apollo, GraphQL, Joule, log4j2 and if in case you are using plain all servers without any framework on the top of it then we can also then you can, we have also support for servers and now the interesting part is uh, i think this is super interesting because many people ask about it right uh, what's the pricing so i used at sentry.io i used this developer account so there is of course some cap on how much you can report and this is free. So it's perfect for trying things out. Like if you want to do your you know, site project or just play with it, this is super nice. In case you are a company and building something that is serious, then there are like several different paid plans uh, you can choose from. But uh, Sentry is also, or more, most importantly, it is open source. Uh, so not only the SDKs, but also the Sentry itself is open source and you can just take it, clone it, or even take the Docker images and install it in your infrastructure. So in Sentry documentation, we have, uh, we have instructions how to do it. And then just, you know, instead of 
sending events to sentry.io, you send events to your own servers and you have exactly the same functionality on your on-premise. Does it answer your question, Sashi? So yes, it does. Yeah, it does. Thanks a lot uh, for taking that question. So we have like one one additional question. Uh, I think two. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll take uh, one soon. Does uh, Sentry have support for MongoDB queries? I think it does, right? I mean, our SDK does not. Okay. Okay. So so we don't provide tracing for MongoDB queries. <coughs> uh, but I would say, if you need it, you can try to build it yourself. That's, that's option number one. Option number two is that you can build it by yourself and create a pull request to Sentry SDK. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the ambitious options. And the lazy option is to go to uh, Sentry SDK GitHub repo and create an issue. And then there is a chance that more people will find it useful and then uh, probably will implement it because that's how our SDK often is like the roadmap is shaped uh, in a, not only, but also by our users. If we see that there is a big demand for some functionality, then we just implement it. Got it. Uh, okay, and there was another question. What is P6Py? So P6Py is a, a, like the wrapper around the JDBC data source that lets you do, do a, a extra thing. That's not our project. This is like a third party project. It's like a standard way of, of measuring the execution time of SQL queries in Java. There are basically like two options, P6Py and data source proxy. We chose P6Py. And if you don't want to trace the JDBC, then you just don't use it. Okay. Right. So now, uh, Sentry has a really good docs also for our SDKs. So everything that I've shown here is in the docs. And if you find something that is maybe a little bit confusing, then you then uh, it's also open source. So you can file an issue in the Sentry docs library. Uh, I will answer all the P6, P6 spy questions when I'm done. Uh, so that's our repo. Go to go, get Sentry slash Sentry Java on GitHub, and you will find pretty much everything that is happening, including this pull request for fixing the uh, web flux. Okay, and this will be it from me. Thank you very much, and hope happy bug fixing in case you have any bugs. And let me answer the last question. That is not a real question. You have to install like this expired. This is just a tiny library. Like this is not something you have to install anywhere. This is not the infrastructure components. P6 Spy sits with your jar, but we added it as a dependency to Sentry JDBC. So you just add Sentry JDBC dependency and this adds P6 Spy automatically. So that's it. Okay, yeah. Uh, so thanks, uh, you know, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Maciej, you know, for uh, a really, really interesting session. Uh, you know, really found the examples pretty uh, interesting. And then, you know, the best part is uh, to really see how easy it is to get started with Sentry. Uh, so, uh, so thanks a lot, uh, and then I really uh, sincerely believe that it's you know very very useful to uh, programmers who attended the session today, and also the programmers who would watch it later on our Facebook page. So, thanks a lot for taking the time out to uh, a really really interesting session. I hope so. Thanks a lot for having me. It was a real pleasure, and thank you for asking uh, questions. It was also very interesting. Yeah. Like if you if you would like uh, you know to ask something more uh, like if you have questions specifically about Sentry or issues or you know requests then go to the GitHub. If you have something specifically to me, then you will find me on Twitter. That's like the best way to to approach me. Right. Uh, so feel free to DM me and so on. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. Thank you. I, I recommend everyone to kind of follow Matches uh, Twitter profile. I, I'm a follower, and it's, it's a very interesting place to uh, kind of uh, know about the uh, all the new developments in the world of Java and Sentry. So thanks everyone. Have a good rest of the evening. Bye-bye.